Hi, this is Lex, and welcome to the Fintech Blueprint. It's your podcast about fintech, decentralized finance, digital banking, investing, robo-advice, artificial intelligence, and all the other frontier technology that is transforming financial services. To get more content, like an illustrated transcript of this conversation in your inbox, subscribe at fintechblueprint.com. So without further delay, let's jump into today's episode. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the podcast. I'm really excited for today's conversation with Stephen Goldfeder, who's the co-founder and CEO of Offchain Labs. And of course, you will know Arbitrum, one of the leading scaling solutions for Ethereum and Web3 generally. We're going to have a fantastic conversation about understanding the productivity of crypto networks, understanding how they work, how they grow, how they scale, and of course, how Arbitrum is planning to grow in the future as well. Stephen, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Really excited to be here. Absolutely. My pleasure. We often start the conversation by trying to understand you and your journey and figuring out kind of what are the things that you're bringing to the space and the projects that you're working on. Tell us a little bit about how you got started in your career, what kind of studies did you do, and sort of what caught your interest? Absolutely. So I was a computer science undergraduate student, and then I started my PhD at Princeton, very interested in cryptography and computer security. And it was 2013 when I started at Princeton, and my advisor, Arvind Narayanan, at the time, said, hey, I'm getting into this new thing called Bitcoin. And I didn't know what Bitcoin was. And he told me all about Bitcoin and the tech behind it. And it was really interesting. And sort of we deep dive together on that. And over the years, I focused my cryptography research really at applications to cryptocurrencies. So a lot of the early work that I did during my PhD was around securing digital assets, threshold cryptography or multi-party computation. The idea is to have multiple parties needed to cryptographically sign a transaction in order for it to get executed. Because you know, it's really, really dangerous or scary to have the finality of cryptocurrency transactions is unlike banking transactions. That was a big focus. And actually, some of my early work, my PhD work went on to be commercialized, not by me, but by other companies. Uh, notably, Fireblocks is, is one of those companies that's doing a fantastic job today and start, started off based on protocols that I worked on. Also, during my PhD career there with Arvind and Ed Felton, my current co-founder, and a few others, we co-authored a, a textbook on cryptocurrencies that's used in, in many universities today. And it was really towards the end of my PhD that I got involved in Arbitrum as an academic project. But actually, the project predated my involvement by a few years. So Ed Felton, my current co-founder, but at the time was a longtime professor at Princeton, a computer science professor and you know, Ed's done also a bunch of stints in government, notably as the deputy CTO of the White House under President Obama and senior advisor to President Obama. And Ed was thinking about scaling smart contracts literally before smart contract platforms existed. If you look at YouTube and look for the earliest mention of Arbitrum, you'll find a January 2015 video that is a culmination of a fall 2014 Princeton class project that Ed was directing with some undergraduate students. And this talked about Arbitrum. And it was really an early, early prototype of, you know, with many similarities to the system that we have today. And that was really the point was to scale smart contracts via these interactive fraud proofs that Arbitrum has become known for. And again, the reason why I love mentioning that date is because it was six months prior to Ethereum's launch in, Je in July of that year. That's pretty incredible, yeah, to be so early and so right. It was a really basic thought process, which was, hey, this technology is here and it looks really, really interesting. But the plumbing and the piping that we have today is not going to bring it to scale. And that was very clear from a technology perspective to anyone looking at this early on. So the question was then, is this going to take off or is it going to sort of go away? And if you, if you believed it was going to take off, it was clear that investing in scaling and scaling solutions was uh, you know, really, really good bet and something that was very, very necessary. So we did that in an academic context. When Ed came back from the White House in 2017, that's when I got involved. And we built out a research paper and published that in the summer of 2018. And that's also when we founded the company. And here we are almost four years later, still building Arbitrum and still 
saying, hey, how can we scale Ethereum even better? How can we even do more? Of course, we have a live product now, but we're also still very much researchers at heart looking to how we can improve this and scale even further. There's going to be a lot to say about getting a crypto company off the ground in 2018, but let's put a pin in that emotional turbulence. And I'm going to ask you a really naive question, but I think an interesting question for our audience, just because of people's different backgrounds. In particular, I want to meditate on this word crypto. This has been your academic and professional pursuit. But the word crypto for so many people triggers feelings of unsafety, of danger. The word encryption, the encryption of information in a browser so that you have a little secure lock in the corner, makes people feel good and happy and like they can put their credit card into the browser and not lose those numbers. But somehow the word crypto got disconnected from the root of you know cryptography and the safety that it generates. Can you tell us just a little bit more about the field of cryptography, like the study, and then maybe place that into the historical context? Like from where did it come? How did it evolve? And what is the study looking like today? Absolutely. That's a really great question. And, and just on the term, to focus on that for a second, it's funny you mentioned it, because for the longest time, like when I started at Princeton, crypto meant cryptography. If you would, you know, back then Google crypto, you know, 2015 or crypto 2013, what you'd find is the annual crypto conference called Crypto in 2013. And really the word meant cryptography to so many people. And many people actually in that field felt like the term was, was stolen from them. And I, I also, for, for a, a long time, like, no, crypto means cryptography, cryptocurrencies, cryptocurrencies. Obviously now we, you know, we don't control language and we've come to uh, understand how people use that term. But there's, a, it's, there's still a strong community that feels that crypto really means cryptography. And to me, it, it, will, it will always mean both. But back then, at least, the term crypto really meant was associated with cryptography, was was making things stronger. And actually, even anecdotally, the, the domains and the like were really held by, by cryptographers. Like Matt Blaze, a cryptographer, a re- cryptography researcher, sold crypto.com, which was his personal website to, to crypto.com today. As, as, a, as a funny aside, those who use their term crypto were really cryptographers earlier on. It's funny because, of course, these two things are related. Cryptocurrencies are currencies based on cryptography, and that's where the term came from. It's funny, though, because cryptocurrencies actually, for the most part, at least at the basic layer, use very, very basic cryptography. There's a lot of more advanced cryptography that's being layered on top today, such as advanced zero-knowledge proofs, etc. But the field of cryptography is actually very, very, very rich. And it dates back into, the modern cryptography dates back into the 70s. You know, also a relatively new field from an academic perspective that said, hey, how can we use mathematical concepts and mathematical techniques to provably secure data, to provably get security, to know that when I communicate with you, I can send you data that even if someone has full access to the wire, they cannot read what I'm writing. So that was what cryptography was really about. It was about securing communications, essentially, essentially, both from the privacy perspective as well as from the authenticity perspective, knowing that, hey, no one else can eavesdrop on what we're listening to. And also that, you know, when you get the message, it really came from me, it wasn't from someone else. And the field has really blossomed into a really much more complex and much more and a very, very rigorous academic field. Cryptocurrencies are both a blessing and a curse to that. It's a blessing because it, it, it gives it an application. Certain cryptography was applied, you know, even the internet, the internet today relies very much on basic cryptography, but cryptocurrencies are yet another application to put basic cryptographic techniques to work and show how powerful they are. And also, you know, there are cultural movements and, you know, language changes that some cryptographers are less comfortable with. But but fundamentally, I think cryptocurrencies are a very, very good thing for the field of cryptography. And really, researchers are always looking for good problems to solve. And, you know, sometimes they're just sort of have to make up problems or theorize about problems, I should say, that, you know, but when you have a real, real world use cases and real, real world needs for solving certain problems, zero knowledge proofs is is a great example. These have been around for, for decades now, but really there's been an explosion of interest, an explosion of progress in the research fields, and it's really driven by the need for these in different cryptocurrency systems. So I think that the two fields very, very much are aligned. Again, I have a very close emotional connection to crypto, meaning cryptography, but also to crypto, meaning cryptocurrencies. I sort of, in my mind, 
merge those two worlds. I think they're very, very close. And, and I do think that it's the crypto, the cryptography that provides security for cryptocurrencies. And of course, you know, it's early on and, you know, there's, there's definitely some uncertainty in people, but I do think that we're building a system ultimately that is very, very secure and has a very, very good backing in, in really, really strong research and, and decades of strong research that we're actually bringing to light in many, many really, really interesting applications today. I find the aside about zero knowledge proofs really interesting in the sense that, you know, you can have some really fundamental academic insight and innovation being derived and then finding no expression in consumer technology for quite a while. You know, and this is kind of the history of neural networks as well, where the concepts behind neural networks were on paper for decades before they could be instantiated into machine vision and natural language processing where there was sufficient kind of processing power to dedicate to to the problem i think around 2013 or 2014 and you couldn't have predicted that moment you couldn't have predicted this platform shift when all of a sudden yeah we all have cameras in our phones and they need a machine vision you know device to recognize people's faces and similarly Nobody could have pinpointed the moment when we have gigantic computational networks running software that <laughs> that need privacy and to be more efficient. So it's, I think that's actually a, a really insightful comment. As you mentioned, you have actually a very close analog in the field of cryptography itself because everything I mentioned was I, I sort of gave a framing of cryptography being the old thing, being around for a few decades, and cryptocurrencies being this new application we can go one step deeper in the stack. For hundreds of years, people were studying number theory as a field of pure mathematics with no really known application, just really studying the beauty of math. And it was really, you know, cryptography and and really the internet that, you know, had these sort of needs for distributed communication that really brought an application to these fields into number theory. So in the past, you know, three, four decades, we've actually taken, you know, a very similar thing. We've had these literally hundreds of years, people studying a field of pure math with no known application at all, and then found an application in cryptography. And then sort of, you know, on a more micro scale, we repeated that again with certain areas of cryptography having no practical application or being very, very theoretical and cryptocurrencies being a really, really good ground for those applications. So it's sort of really, really interesting. You have this sort of two-layered, you know, it's happened almost twice in the field of cryptography and cryptocurrencies. I want to meditate on just one more question around this topic, which is Bitcoin. And and you said that was one of the things that drew you into the space what do you think from a technology perspective or from a mathematical perspective, what do you think gave Bitcoin the juice to become real, you know, whereas prior attempts, Digicash and others, weren't able to get to the same outcome? Was there something in the design or in the state of the art that you think drove it, or was it just the right moment? I think it's a combination of a few things. The, the actual cryptography in Bitcoin is, is, is very basic. But what the innovation was putting a few pieces together. So we had this idea, the blockchain data structure was also not invented by Bitcoin, dates back to the early 90s. And it was really putting together a few things, the building blocks of the blockchain data structure, you know, digital signatures, the, the cryptography component, and also the incentive component, right? So the currency was sort of incentivizing people to, to take part in the network and secure the network. So I think it's very, very much, there's actually... So my advisor, I mentioned before, my PhD advisor has a really, really good paper on this called Bitcoin's Academic Pedigree, which sort of maps back all the pieces that Bitcoin put together. But I think it was really the idea of standing all these pieces up together rather than innovation in a particular area. It wasn't like Bitcoin pushed forward the field of cryptography or even data structures, but it was this ingenious way of setting up these pieces together that really hadn't been done before. You know, people got close, they had two or three of these pieces and just missing one, but it was the idea of putting the data structure, the cryptography, and really the, the currency application and the incentives together that I think are, are the core innovation that Bitcoin led to. And, uh, you know, there's also obviously a moment in time as well. There was a movement here. There have been several previous attempts that have failed for different reasons. And there were people that were very, very interested in this, a fringe element at the time, but a meaningful one. So I think both the cultural element as well as the 
putting these pieces of technology together that have been independently developed over you know many years. It was just a stage of set set for for this. And, and again, I'm not trying to limit the innovation of Bitcoin. Putting these together was absolutely you know remarkable and and, and very 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 ingenious combination of, of different technologies. But I think the stage was set then for again, but do again to a combination of a bunch of things being ready at the time. Gotcha. Okay. So to get us back on the story, so you are doing a PhD at Princeton, you're doing research at Google, at Microsoft, and then at Cornell at some point. How do you first become aware of kind of smart contracts and the types of things that they're being used for? And how do you integrate into off-chain labs? Like what was that moment like? Yeah, great question. So yeah, I was aware of smart contracts from relatively early on. Again, I was involved in Bitcoin and the technology there from early on. And uh, even like the Ethereum white paper, yellow paper, or white paper, I guess, at the time. This was like a very, very interesting topic to me from an academic pursuit, even before it existed. And again, from a, an academic question, a lot of the early questions we worked on was like, hey, how do we do this in the rules of Bitcoin? Like, for example, how do we do what I mentioned before, split key signing in Bitcoin? And then sort of, you know, the idea of smart contracts come along and a lot of these things become easier because you have this scriptable language that you can do. It's Turing complete, which means you can basically, you know, program, you have a much richer language that you can program with. So, you know, I was very, very interested in this from an academic perspective. Interestingly, from an academic perspective, in the early days, it almost felt like, oh, you know, this makes certain things too easy. But of course, smart contracts have a lot of academic need. And, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done there as well, as we see in scaling. So I, I was aware of smart contracts earlier on and, and, and relatively interested in them. But it was really a scaling question that got me very, very interested working with Ed and some others at Princeton on this question, Ed and Harry and some others. Uh, around, hey, how do we build technology that that scales this? Because you know the basic idea of a smart contract is a shared computer, and in Ethereum's case, it's a single threaded computer. And the question is, though, this is really, really, really powerful. If we can all get consensus on a computer and program it how we want and transact with it, and it's completely trustless, it's very, very, very powerful. But it's inefficient for everyone to re-execute the exact same computation over time to sort of have to, everyone's limited to the capacity of this one single threaded machine. So we asked ourselves, how can we, how can we scale this? How can we use this as sort of the backbone security layer, build other layers on top of this to, to scale this platform? That became a very, very interesting question to me, which is, again, came from the idea of, I think this technology, what Ethereum is doing with smart contracts are extraordinarily powerful. And they'll be able to, you know, allow us to realize applications that would simply be impossible, certainly without you know any blockchain, but even on blockchains that weren't as expressive, Ethereum by contrast would allow us to do things that are that are much, much more powerful. But the question was, how do we bring this to the masses? Because we're like, this is really cool. There's gotta be a lot of demand for this, but we're not able to scale with the techniques that we know today. Yeah, I want to pause on kind of a definition of a single threaded computer and just generally what a computer is. One of the versions of blockchain hype that gets people kind of disbelieving the utopian stories that often you hear in the space when people describe, you know, all the fantastic things that web3 can do and could do and then, you know, we're faced with slow blocks, slow computation, slow transaction times and then very expensive transaction times related to the supply and demand of that computation and so on. And so I don't think there is a very clear narrative today that explains look, this is the machine we have, and then this is what it means if this machine were to function you know, with full capacity. And I often go to an example of thinking of the early Pong game or the Mario Nintendo game, the 8-bit version, where everything is giant pixels and there's just a tiny, tiny amount of memory and it's clearly compressed. It's clearly you know, very low fidelity, but you can draw a line from that you know, eight color pixel game all the way through to the rendering that the Unreal Engine can do today that essentially is in the background of every single movie and simulates the whole environment in, you know, in real time 3D. And it's sort of the same underlying concept from that first pixel to the hyper-realistic rendering. 
Can you talk a little bit about this kind of like Nintendo version of Ethereum, this compressed, pixelated, single-threaded computer? What is it really? And how do you see that starting to expand towards the vision of the much broader, powerful version that we talk about? Absolutely. So Ethereum is basically, as you were saying, a computer where everyone can come to agreement on what the computer does. And single-threaded is a term that basically means everything sort of happens in in order and everyone's doing one thing at a time as opposed to being able to have many processors that are running in parallel and you can do a lot of things at once. And and what that means is basically the speed of the network is as slow as this like single queue. You can only move as fast as basically a single machine can operate, right? Because if you allow, if the network was like parallelized and can have other machines, you know, many machines doing the same thing at once, then the network can potentially move faster. If the network is single-threaded, that means that everyone is as slow as the sort of single machine in the network, and you can't, by adding more machines, just make it a lot faster. And there's a critical reason why that's true. That's how you gain the security of Ethereum. That's how you gain the decentralization. So let me dig into that for a second. What does this mean? So we have these, this, this computer that's trustless. Well, how is it trustless? How are we able to know that it does the right thing? And the answer is because you have this decentralized wide network that's verifying this computation. They're actually running, these Ethereum nodes are actually running the computation and verifying it and making sure that they agree with it. So two things are important here. One is to actually enable the nodes to to verify the computation. And that's why every node has to essentially verify everything on, on Ethereum. That's a bottleneck. But also the question is, who runs these nodes? What type of machines are these? What is the capacity of these machines? Can we just say, okay, let's make you run really, really, really powerful machines. Like maybe you have to have a data center to 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 validate Ethereum. And if you do that, maybe you can scale that way. But the answer is, at least in Ethereum's view, and in my view as well, no, that doesn't work. Because what happens is, if you make the requirements to participate really, really high, you basically cut out a lot of people from being able to participate. For example, someone running a machine in their house or someone even running a relatively lightweight cloud instance, like maybe a, an Amazon or an AWS cloud instance, won't be able to run an Ethereum node. They won't be able to participate in the network. But as you limit who can participate, you basically limit the security and decentralization of the network. If you made it such that in order to participate in Ethereum, you needed to literally have like a supercomputer or run a data center, then it may technically be a decentralized and permissionless network, permissionless meaning anyone who wants can participate. But in practice, it's not really because most people can't get their hands on the machinery to participate. So what Ethereum does is two things. It makes it super, super easy for anyone to participate. And it only actually uses a relatively low low amount of computation. And in doing so, it accomplishes the idea that anyone on their sort of you know regular and not so exotic machinery can participate in Ethereum and help verify and validate Ethereum. And that's what really gives you the decentralized guarantees, the security guarantees, because you know there's such a wide set of participants in the network because the barrier to entry is so low. Now, this is great, but it's also problematic because when you make the barrier to entry so low that even you know, relatively lightweight machines can participate, you also make the capacity of the network as slow as the slowest machine in the network, right? It's not parallelized. It's not like we can do many things at once. So you're basically limited by the slowest machine of the network. And we want the network to be open that a wide variety of participants can participate even if they don't have their hands on exotic hardware. And that's where scaling becomes necessary. And to put what we do in Arbitrum in, in a nutshell what we do is we, we get the security and decentralization from, from Ethereum. We have this wide, broad network. That's Ethereum. We rely on Ethereum hev- heavily. But we optimize what we put in Ethereum. We say, okay, can we get more mileage out of our Ethereum space? Can we use less on Ethereum, do more off-chain, but just put just the right amount on Ethereum that Ethereum can validate and verify everything we're doing, but not sort of put everything on Ethereum, just enough to get the security but optimize it in a way that we're able to do a lot more than we do by just putting everything directly on Ethereum. And so what are examples within that everything? Like what would be in and what would be out? And I guess this is a way of just asking, you know, what is Arbitrum and, you know, how does it work? How do optimistic rollups work? Or maybe what are the different approaches to the scaling issue that you've described? And then how Arbitrum, what choices does it make? 
So I'll give you a toy example first, just to motivate the idea of not putting everything on Ethereum. And then I'll sort of dive into how optimistic rollups actually work. But a toy example is, imagine you and I were playing chess. And if you put everything on Ethereum, it means I move and I put it on Ethereum, you move and you put it on Ethereum. And we sort of just put everything on Ethereum. But that means that any every Ethereum miner is going to have to validate, every Ethereum node, I should say, is going to have to validate our chess game but it might actually not be that interesting to them because maybe like we'll just agree on the winner, right? You and I play and you beat me and, and, and I just pay you out. And I, you know, imagine we put a bet on that and I pay you and say you won, right? So if we could, instead of putting every move on the chain, if we could optimistically say, hey, I'm only going to put enough on the, on the chain such that if we have a dispute, Ethereum can resolve that. But in the case where we don't have this, we're, we're in total agreement that you won the game and I owe you money and I pay you that money. Maybe we don't need to actually use those resources. So the idea of an optimistic system in general is, is exactly this. It's let's put just enough on chains. We have the mechanism that Ethereum can validate what it needs to validate or the system can validate what it needs to validate in a world where we ask it to. But in the optimistic case and the happy case, maybe we can just get away with Ethereum not doing that, right? In the game of chess, if you and I agree, we don't really need to make it that everyone validates every move, right? If someone comes in 100 years from now and wants to get up the state in Ethereum, are they going to have to really replay our chess game? And, and we agreed, like, what's the point of this? What is it even providing us? But, but let's say we just had a disagreement. We'd want to know that Ethereum can resolve that. So it's really about putting enough on chain to resolve disputes, but not doing everything on chain in the happy case. And if you apply this idea to a blockchain system much, much more generally, so transactions are coming in, to the network and computation is happening. We're saying a transaction might say, add these two numbers, do this computation, store this thing. And the question is, what is the minimum amount that we need to put on Ethereum in order for Ethereum to validate what we're doing? And the concept in an optimistic rollup is basically you put all the data on Ethereum. Actually, this is true of all rollups. You put all the data on Ethereum, all the basic transaction data. So you could think of a transaction in two ways. You could think of it as the zeros and ones, the actual bits of data. And then you can think about it in terms of the instructions of what it said. So a transaction is just a blob of data, but it might tell you, add these two numbers, store this item, do this computation. The data is critical though, to have consensus on the data. Because if we don't even have, if you and I don't even agree, if everyone doesn't agree on what the underlying set of transactions is, it's very, very hard to get consensus on what the output is. So we put all the raw data on Ethereum in a very, very compressed way. So all the transaction data goes in Ethereum, but it goes in there in a very, very compressed way. And then all the instructions like, hey, add these two numbers, compute this, store this, that happens off-chain. And instead, we report back the result to Ethereum. And we prove to Ethereum, essentially, in optimistic rollups via a fraud proof mechanism, which I I can talk more about, we prove to Ethereum it's correct. And the way that this works is we say to Ethereum, hey, we put all the underlying data on chain, all those, the blob of data, right? the blobs, the transaction blobs. Don't worry about these. We're just going to put them here and they'll be here in case you need them. And then we go ahead and off chain, execute all those things and report back to Ethereum the result. And an optimistic rollup optimizes for that happy case and says, hey, this is the result. And if you and I agree, if everyone agrees, then, then Ethereum doesn't need to do anything more. It just waits some period of time to make sure no one's complaining, and it accepts it and says, okay, great, this is the result. Right? This is akin to us playing chess and agreeing. We don't need Ethereum to sort of rerun our chess game because there's no dispute. But Ethereum opens up a window of time where anyone can dispute this update and say, hey, I disagree with that. You know, Steven posted an update on chain or this validator posted an update on chain that says that these transactions happened and this was the result. Uh, or this withdrawal happened, but I disagree with that. I think that's actually not correct. I think Ethereum, if you would go ahead and take those transactions that you have, you know, the raw data and execute them, you'd come up with a different result. And then we supply a very, very efficient mechanism where Ethereum can zero down on the point of disagreement and mediate that dispute and run on chain just the minimal amount it needs to run to verify which claim is correct. Is the claim that I put on chain correct or is it wrong? So that's the basic idea. Optimistically, don't do the work on chain, allow people to challenge. And if they challenge via a very efficient protocol, give Ethereum the tools it needs to mediate that dispute. The tools it needs are number one, that raw data on chain needs to have the basic unprocessed data. 
And then it has a very efficient process in which it can referee this dispute and figure out who the winner is. That sounds like magic. It's kind of like explaining a compression concept that uh, is super powerful. Can I ask for some context setting? So with this technology implemented, what kind of performance do we expect out of Web3 computation? Like what kinds of transactions, what kind of scale, right? Is it fit for purpose for payments, for exchange? Like how do we think about what the system and this type of compression can support? It's a great question. And the answer is there are sort of different bottlenecks here. So in scaling this way, we've very much taken away the computation bottleneck out of the system. So we can do a lot of computation, but without having Ethereum do the computation itself and taking that off chain, not using up Ethereum space on the computation. One problem that still exists though is that the state of the network, the data just still grows and that data needs to be kept somewhere. So even if you move the built up state off of Ethereum, you know, you can't say, okay, let's do 100,000 transactions per second because there's still now all these transaction data and that's another limitation. When you want nodes to be able to participate in the network, they have to keep track of a massively growing database it becomes problematic. And also for a new node to join the network, it becomes problematic if they have to, you know, spend so much time just getting up to speed. So these are the, what I would say, where the scaling frontier is today. By, by virtue of our design, we've solved very much the computation problem. We've done a lot towards increasing the capacity, but the where the frontier is, it's really on how do we deal with what's called state load. State is just the size of the machine. How do we deal with this? And I'll tell you some, some ideas of how we're dealing with this and what I expect to see in the future. One is really, really interesting. You can have not only one rollup on Ethereum, you could have multiple rollups on Ethereum that all share the same settlement layer. And in doing so, you basically have some version of parallelization. Remember I said before Ethereum is single-threaded? That's true. And, and each rollup is single-threaded as well. But Ethereum can actually support multiple rollups. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if going forward, you saw different rollups in different categories where maybe there's a gaming rollup or a DeFi and NFT rollup, and you have sort of different categories where people, ultimately there's a benefit of being co-located with projects that are similar to you, but I also imagine that we'll see some of this parallelization via different rollups specialized for different categories on top of Ethereum. But there's also a lot of fundamental work that we can do in solving some of these problems. And that is, for example, something known as light clients or stateless clients, which is how can we allow people to verify Ethereum by not actually having to keep all the large state on board. And if you can do that and solve that with a high degree of security, then you can still allow relatively low performance nodes to participate in the network and not require them to store a massively growing trove of data. So to answer your question, I guess, in more concrete terms, today we're throttling our capacity as we grow, but fundamentally, you know, we can easily scale today to hundreds of transactions per second in a single rollup. Getting past that is going to require us to do some more work on stateless clients and the like, and really say, how do we build clients? How are we okay with building state larger than that? And this is not a roll-up problem. This is a problem that's shared by any blockchain, layer one, layer two, whatever the technology it uses. Fundamentally, if you're growing the state quickly, you have to ask yourself, who is storing that state? And how can we make it that people who don't want to store that state can participate, right? Because there's no way to get to 100,000 transactions per second without the state growing by 100,000 transactions per second. And that's a lot. So, you know, we've done a lot to scale computation and really, really our fees are about 97% cheaper than Ethereum today and going down lower. We're throttling, but our capacity is probably 10x Ethereum, what we'd be comfortable to run. But going past that, again, is going to require solving some other problems that we're working on. Two follow-up questions, and they're related, which is helpful. The first is a question about demand, right? So scalability is a reaction to somebody needing to use the network. And so as you've turned the network on, what does demand look like? What is it that people are doing that is, you know, requiring this additional computation? You know, and in particular, definitely interested in what types of things are they doing 
relative to what they could do before, given the higher throughput. I think that's quite interesting. The second related question would be, like, how do they get on? So what are the bridges? What are the pathways? What are the mechanics to actually use Arbitrum? And how does that work? Yeah, so on the first question, what are people doing? There are basically two different classes of things that people are doing today in very, very broad terms. One is you're doing the same types of things they were doing before, but at lower cost. So you might you know, just be doing a transfer, sending ETH to your friend or sending USDC to your friend or to a business for payment. But now you're doing that with a much, much lower transaction fee, right? So whereas you might pay 10 or 15 or $20 on Ethereum, you might pay 50 cents or, or, or so on Arbitrum to do that today. So that's one thing, which is not innovating in what they're doing, but the price is much lower. But actually, even on that one, even just doing the same things for cheaper, you're enabling new things, enabling new opportunities and new experiences for a larger class of people because people that might be priced out at the Ethereum level fees are priced in and can participate in Arbitrum. So you're really growing the network and being much, much more inclusive to who is this available to, who can participate. And similarly, we have you know ex- exchanges and Arbitrum, we have DeFi and Arbitrum, you have DeFi and Ethereum. Some of the projects are the same. You have, for example, Uniswap, SushiSwap, Curve, Aave, etc. Many of the largest Ethereum projects are, are live in Arbitrum offering a very similar service. And in some sense, they're offering the same service just for cheaper, but it also enables new opportunities. Retail DeFi is one great example. If you're a retail user that has just you know a few dollars to trade, it's not possible to do that on Ethereum because the fee you'll pay is just going to dwarf the amount that you want to trade. You can't do a $5 or $10 or really even a $100 trade in Ethereum meaningfully because you do one or two of these and you won't really have anything left. You'll have paid all to fees. On Arbitrum, of course, the fees are much, much lower, 95% plus lower on average today. And therefore, it just enables more people to do more even with the same tools. And the second class that we're seeing are people doing things that either weren't possible or didn't make any sense to do on Ethereum. So not just doing the same things or cheaper, but doing more things. I'll give two examples here. Doing things that are fundamentally more expressive and and weren't being done on Ethereum. One is we're seeing a, a lot of really, really strong teams building options and derivative platforms. And a lot of them, their transactions are quite expensive. And they also you know, want to operate very, very quickly. And these are things that were, were not always possible for them to do on, e- on Ethereum. Their transactions were so expensive that in some cases, you might not have even fit them on Ethereum. Or in doing so, you know, the cost would have been hundreds of dollars or used up you know, an entire Ethereum block to do a single transaction. So we're seeing a lot of really strong platforms on Arbitrum today, like Dopex, for example, GMX, FutureSwap. They're doing things that are you know, DeFi experiences but in ways that are much more powerful than what you do on, on layer one. And the reason layer one here meaning Ethereum. And the reason for that is it's enabled generally by the lower fees. And another example that we're seeing really the early emergings of today, and I think it's going to get a lot stronger, is gaming on the blockchain. If, if you're playing a game, for game developers, the considerations are often such. Number one, I want there to be a really, really good game. Number two, I want it to be connected to the blockchain. But you want it to appeal to people that are just interested in the game, even if they don't care about the underlying blockchain part. And you know, if you're on Ethereum and the fees are tens or hundreds of dollars, it doesn't really make sense to build a game. You can't be in the background if your wallet's being drained. But on Arbitrum, uh, where the fees are much, much lower, you actually can have you know meaningful gaming experiences where you can hit the blockchain and users will enjoy this game and their wallets won't be drained. And actually, uh, we can touch on this potentially later, we're building Arbitrum AnyTrust, which is an even lower fee variant of Arbitrum that's optimized towards gaming, towards these high volume of transactions. The idea is you want to build a good experience that has you know a constant touch to the blockchain, but it, it constantly you know touches the blockchain, but also doesn't drain users' wallets. To your second question, how do users get onto the network? There are a few ways. One is there's decentralized bridges. We have the Arbitrum bridge, which we put out ourselves as some bridge that Arbitrum.io. There are also a lot of third-party bridges, some really, really strong teams like Hop, Connect, Seller, and, and a bunch of really, really other strong projects that are building bridges today. And often these are bridges that go from Ethereum to Arbitrum, but also go cross-network. So you can you know, bridge from many, many different blockchain platforms directly. The other point which I'd like to focus on, which I think Arbitrum is the only layer two that has significant 
centralized exchange integrations. So if you're a Binance or FTX or Huobi or OKX or Crypto.com, et cetera, Bybit, we have about a dozen, KuCoin, a dozen exchanges or so today that support Arbitrum directly. And what that means is, I'll just take Binance as an example. If you're a Binance user and say, hey, I, you have ETH on Binance. You say, I want to withdraw my ETH from Binance to the blockchain. So Binance will now give you a drop down which says, okay, you can withdraw your ETH to Ethereum. right? You can say, hey, give me my ETH on Ethereum. You can withdraw your ETH to Binance Smart Chain, or you can withdraw your ETH to Arbitrum. So we have direct exchange integrations with many of the largest centralized exchanges that allow you to deposit and withdraw your funds directly. And that's, for many users, the easiest onboarding path, particularly for users who store their funds in some of the largest centralized exchanges. This is the easiest onboarding path. Literally in one click, they can have ETH and often other assets as well that are directly supported to the Arbitrum network. And similarly, if they want to go from the Arbitrum network back to their exchange, the deposits are also similarly supported. A Binance will just say, okay, here's an Arbitrum deposit address. You do an Arbitrum transaction, a low fee Arbitrum transaction, and your funds are right back in your Binance account. How do you see these experiences for bridging and more generally the experiences in a multi-chain, multi-rail ecosystem getting abstracted over time? Maybe another way to frame it is, where do you think the abstraction to connect all the rails will happen? Do you think it's a kind of power laws will accrue to the best scaling technologies with ETH as the settlement layer? Or do you think it's something that happens you know, in the wallet or in the app? How are you thinking about it? Yeah, so a few things. One is bridging is important and will always be important. But the other thing is, you know, we're building a very, very strong ecosystem on Arbitrum where you know, there's going to be a lot to do and a lot of the innovation is happening there. So one pattern we're seeing is users are just coming and storing their funds in Arbitrum, you know, just parking their funds there. And I think that's really important. And it plays into bridging because, of course, bridging is important and getting on and off the network and the ability to get on and off is very important. But I think users are increasingly realizing that Arbitrum is also a really good place to park your assets you know, for the long term because the idea is many users realize, hey, when I want to use my funds, I'll likely have an opportunity in Arbitrum that I want to use. And you know, it's interesting, if you look at different, a lot of, there are a lot of these sites out there that track TVL or total value locked, and there are often big discrepancies between them. Some people will say we have three or four billion, and some sites will say we have two billion. And if you dig in, the discrepancy is generally... Some sites are counting value locked in particular DeFi protocols, whereas others are counting only value value locked on the network. And there's a discrepancy there. What that means is there's a lot of users that are coming to Arbitrum. They're not necessarily even participating in a protocol just yet. They're just parking their funds in their wallets in Arbitrum. And that's a really, really strong sign to me, again, when it comes to bridging, which means a lot of users, two or three years ago, I might have told you that the L2 experience will be such that You'll, you'll keep your funds on layer one and you'll sort of go to L2 to do a fast transaction in, in whatever realm you want to do, a, a, a swap, et cetera, you know, whatever you want to do. And then you'll sort of retreat back to layer one. That's, I think, what a lot of people theorized what would happen. And part of the reason is people never imagined there would be mass adoption of a layer two early on. So you sort of have to have this experience. If many of your apps you want to use are on layer one, some are on layer two, you need really this fast experience where you go into layer two, do what you want to do, get back out and park your funds on layer one. But that's not at all how we've seen things play out. Even from the earliest launch, you know, from day one of Arbitrum public launch this summer, we had tens of, of apps on the platform. We have hundreds of apps today on the platform. And the idea is it's really a full-fledged ecosystem, be it NFTs, every flavor of DeFi, gaming. There's a lot, a lot going on in Arbitrum. And bridging is, while important for many users, not the critical focus. They're happy to be on Arbitrum and stay on, on Arbitrum. And I think that's something that's really, really important. But but long term, I do think that you know bridging will become important. I also think we're seeing some really interesting, I'll say early on projects now that are thinking not about just bridging assets, right? Not about just moving tokens from one chain to another, but also bridging experiences and allowing developers to build protocols that are sort of live on different chains and bridge liquidity from different chains. And I think we'll see a lot more of that. There are some fundamental problems there that need to be solved from a research perspective, but it's encouraging to see teams building this because ultimately as a blockchain user, right now you're thinking very much about what chain you're on, but as we go more and more and more and more mainstream, 
users are going to think a lot more about the applications than they necessarily will about what chain they're on. And I think, you know, these sort of bridging experiences that allow developers to do, to build experiences that are seamless across different chains are also going to become very important. Absolutely. That's a fantastic place for us to draw an exclamation mark for this conversation. If our audience wants to learn more about you, learn more about Arbitrum and Off-Chain Labs, where should they go? Great question. So first of all, following our Twitter is a great way to find more information on what we're doing, who we're partnering with, at Arbitrum on Twitter, also at Off-Chain Labs on Twitter for the company. We have a very, very active Discord where you can come and ask questions and uh, gain direct access to the team. You know, please come participate there. Be you a developer, a user, whoever you are, whatever your questions are, you know, we have a very welcoming and open community and we're happy to, to answer those questions. If you're someone that might be looking for a job and you don't have to be a developer, developers are always welcome, but also, you know, we're hiring across every area. You know, offchainlabs.com slash careers is a great place to look at the opportunities there. Also, you can always feel free to reach out directly. My Twitter DMs are open. If you're a developer or a project or a candidate or have questions, you can definitely feel free to reach out directly to myself or the company. And we're always happy to engage in conversations and really educate and also see how can we work with others and build this together. Because ultimately, it's not us building by ourselves. We need many, many partners and many individuals to build with us. We're building critical infrastructure, what we believe is for decades and more to come. And we need all the help we can get. And doing so requires us to, you know, we can't do this alone. We need really everyone's help. Awesome. Stephen, thank you so much for coming on today and sharing so much wisdom with us. Thank you so much. Definitely. Thank you for having me. Really, really appreciate it. Hi, everyone. That's it for this week's episode of the FinTech Blueprint. For more technical deep dives into all things fintech and decentralized finance, check out fintechblueprint.com and grab a free subscription to the newsletter. This is Lex, and I'll see you next time. <music>